Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the uh, next National Security College public lecture. Uh, the latest in quite a series we've been putting together since the inception of the college. By way of introduction, for those of you who don't know, the National Security College is a joint venture between the Commonwealth and the Australian National University. We conduct a range of executive professional development programs and academic programs in conjunction with both the Commonwealth and the ANU. Uh, part of that is a series of public outreach lectures and uh, that's what we're at tonight. My name is Mark O'Neill. I'm one of the lecturers at the National Security College, currently on secondment from the Australian Department of Defence. Just by way of admin, before we start, uh, if there's a need to evacuate the building, it'll be through the doors that you entered at the rear, out through the foyer and to the front of the building, out on Riverside Street and the city of the roundabout. Could I ask if you have any phones, Blackberries, or any other similar electronic devices that you now switch into silent and or turn them off? Um, from time immemorial, <coughs> soldiers have always wondered what is over the hill. They wanted to know what is there, what the threats are, what the terrain looks like, and ideally to have a bird's eye perspective of the battlefield. And truly, since time immemorial, it's probably been a soldier's <coughs> dream to be able to reach out from a safe position and inflict harm upon the enemy once they do locate them on that remote far side of the hill. And equally desirable is the ability to do this with accuracy, persistence and precision. First the development of the balloon and then the manned aircraft went a long way to achieving some of these things. But even then, not without difficulties. These difficulties include, amongst other things, things as diverse as cost, persistence and survivability. But arguably the development of unmanned drones has gone a long way to addressing many of these, notwithstanding the ongoing problem with the weather, which we still haven't been able to invent a way around. And the use of drones has come a long way in a relatively short period of time. My own military career is illustrative. I was reflecting on this the other day. When I was in Somalia in 1993, we didn't have any drones. The current CDF, the battalion commander of the 1st Battalion, probably would have quite liked to have had the abilities the modern commanders have uh, that drones offer when he was, and his unit was pursuing bandits through the camel form of Baidella province. And I move forward to my most recent deployment in Iraq where the use of drones was now persistent and pervasive and frequently lethal. It was a feature of that conflict. And through to this day in the current ongoing operations in Afghanistan, where Australian troops now, I would contest, would regard it almost as unthinkable uh, to operate without them. Now, whilst Australian drones are not armed, uh, Australian troops undoubtedly do gain some ancillary benefit from the use of armed drones that our allies operate in Afghanistan. But these drones and their use isn't without problems, questions with ethics, morality and legality. And to deal with that today, my colleague Christian Enemark will speak to us on the topic of predators, reapers and post-heroic war. Christian is an Associate Professor at the National Security College. He has honours degree in Politics and Law from the University of Sydney. He completed his PhD here at the Australian National University in 2006, looking at the topic of disease and security. He has taught courses on military ethics for some years and has been published in internationally peer-reviewed academic journals. Prior to joining the National Security College, he taught at the Centre for International Security Studies at the University of Sydney. And he has an article forthcoming <coughs> later this year about drones and this very issue in the journal Asian Security. Christian, I'm going to address the audience on the topic of predators, reapers and post war. Thanks very much, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Uh, since I arrived at the college in February, uh, my colleague Mark O'Neill has been an excellent sounding board uh, for discussions of matters military. Uh, but I hasten to add that he's not to be blamed for anything I'll be saying tonight. Um, I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank my colleague uh, Ash for his organisation of tonight's uh, seminar. Uh, thank you all of you uh, for coming along uh, tonight. Um, for the last several years, members of the US Armed Forces have been carrying out airstrikes using unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, colloquially known as drones. They've been doing that against targets inside Afghanistan, and drones flying over Pakistan are reportedly operated by officers of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. And most recently, US drones have been deployed in Yemen, Libya, and Somalia. Now, at the outset, let me uh, make an important distinction between the unarmed drones that Mark mentioned, 
which are used for surveillance and reconnaissance, and armed drones that are actually used to kill an enemy directly. The latter, so-called hunter-killer drones, are the subject of our consideration this evening. So this seminar explores the question of whether or how the use of hunter-killer drones like the Predator and the Reaper is changing the character of war. The character of war is shaped by more than just strategic, operational and technological considerations. There are also other dimensions which help us to define what war is, help us to describe how war seems to be changing. Historical, legal, ethical and social dimensions needing to be considered also. Drone technology enables risk-free killing and as such it poses a fundamental challenge to traditional notions of what it means to be a combatant and the status of war as something that's morally distinguishable from other forms of organised violence. Now throughout history new military technologies have occasion debate over the changing character of war. Stirrups, the longbow, the crossbow, the submarine, the tank, the machine gun, gunpowder generally. In the case of drones, the newness, if anything, is about the users of force, rather than, or at least in addition to, the amount of force or the means of applying it. So the longbow was outrageous, not just because of its strategic power, but because a peasant armed with that weapon could defeat an aristocratic knight on horseback. The advent of nuclear weapons afforded or required room for greater civilian involvement in military decision making because strategies had to be devised to avoid war as well as or rather than to win it. And now we're faced with a drone operator who kills without experiencing any physical risk and thus requiring none of the courage that for millennia has distinguished the warrior's profession from all others. And my main message tonight is that by focusing too much on the immediate military advantages of armed drones, we risk not affording adequate consideration to possible long-term disadvantages. We need to acknowledge the risk that the bad effects generated <coughs> by risk-free drone strikes will outweigh the good effects. So we'll be touching on some fundamental issues concerning the character of war uh, tonight, and as citizens of a democracy, this is the concern for both military professionals and civilians alike. This is of concern to Australia, the issue of hunter-killer drones. Along with every other country in the world, we, play, we pay close attention to shifts in the military behaviour of the world's superpower, the USA. We have a close alliance with the US. The premiums we pay on our strategic insurance policy range from political and diplomatic support to military cooperation in distant lands military activities in theatres where drones are or could be deployed. Australia has its own small-scale drone capability. What might the future hold if, when and under what circumstances an Australian drone operator would use that drone to fire a missile and kill? Because we need to debate the operational, ethical and social issues are raised before the advent of an Australian hunter-killer drone. And the outcome of that debate may preclude or hasten such a development. And indeed, discussing this issue of hunter-killer drones serves to flush out a lot of broader concerns about the relationship between civilians and military <coughs> professionals, a relationship which is too often characterised by mutual misunderstanding and suspicion. So, a number of themes I'll be considering tonight. First, very briefly, the rather controversial notion of post-heroic war. Secondly, I'll give you a quick survey of the state of hunter-killer drone technology. And for the most part, I want to linger on the drone operators themselves and their status as killers in war and ask some sociological questions about the identity and purpose of the military profession. And lastly, I'll, join you, I'll ask you to join me in speculating a little bit about the future of civil military relations, the future of unmanned war. And we can ask the question, is the rise of the hunter-killer drone to be seen as an aberration, or, is it, or does it herald a transformation in military affairs? So first to post-heroic war. Heroic in the sense that someone, a nation that is, can be consumed by a heroic effort. A heroic effort by an entire nation motivated by the need to survive 
and or advance an idea. Determination, altruism on a grand scale. A nation acting in a heroic fashion as distinct from individual acts of heroism and courage uh, by individual members of the military, which we will certainly come to later. The term post-heroic war can be traced back at least as far as a 1995 article in Foreign Affairs magazine by the American military historian Edward Lookback. In past wars that were fought for great grand purposes, there was an implied willingness to accept a large number of casualties. And Lookback explains that that sort of fitted in well with the demographic situation of pre-industrial and early industrial societies <coughs> where infectious disease was a much greater element of day-to-day -day life and people knew that they would lose a certain number of or could lose a certain number of their children, they had large families. The notion of losing a youngster in combat, however tragic, was back then somehow fundamentally less unacceptable uh, than it is for today's American and Australian families. So children formed a greater part, they do form a greater part of the family's emotional economy, as Edward Lutwak would put it, today. But over the course of the 20th century, which eventually saw the ending of conscription in the West, there grew a greater and greater gulf as between military values and civilian values. Death was being banished as the overriding preoccupation of society. Infant mortality declined. Life expectancy increased. Peace became a settled expectation of civilian populations. And this idea of martial sacrifice and the idea of a noble death in combat became, for ordinary civilians, an extreme destiny, something implausible and exotic. So unfamiliar was it all to we civilians. And so today the concept of post-heroic war implies an ideal of low rates of mortality amongst friendly military personnel and possibly even civilian population and enemy personnel as well. And proponents of post-heroic war are very attracted to the possibilities of great accuracy and precision that are afforded by military technologies, and in particular, the promise of air power. And throughout the 1990s, air power seemed uniquely suited to the kind of post-heroic wars in which the United States was said to be involved. Wars for limited aims, fought with partial means for marginal interests. The US military historian Elliot Cohen said of air power, it is an unusually seductive form of military strength, in part because, like modern courtship, it appears to offer gratification without commitment. <laughs> and America's abstemious appetite for post-heroic warfare traces its origins back to the aftermath of the Vietnam War. And the trauma institutionally for military professions of the Vietnam War arguably endures, at least in part, to this day. Various authors have identified symptoms of a US preference for post-heroic war, such as the rapid withdrawal of US troops from Somalia in the mid-1990s after the Black Hawk Down disaster, and an apparent unwillingness by the United States to send ground troops to stop genocides in the Balkans and Rwanda also in the mid-1990s. The zenith of post-heroic warfare, arguably, was the 1999 triumph by NATO in the skies over Kosovo. And so determined were the NATO Kosovo campaign commanders not to lose any NATO pilots, bomber aircraft had to remain above 15,000 feet and thus beyond the range of Serbian anti-aircraft fire. And this produced a, a raft of literature about post heroic war, riskless warfare, and the, uh, the great age of air power. But was this to endure? Does this notion of post-heroic warfare survive the advent of the war on terror, which has been described by so many of our political leaders as a truly heroic effort. And following the 11 September 2001 attacks, it was certainly not the case that the United States relied only on limited use of air power. It used the full spectrum of its military capabilities. And for those of us in the 21st century who have grown accustomed to peace, the human and economic costs of the war on terror must seem large, possibly even heroic in scale. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, a very different kind of war is being waged, if it can be called a war at all. It's a drone war, large scale and yet supposedly secret, in which one side can apparently kill with impunity. 
As the United States and its allies tire of the heroic effort of prosecuting and funding their global war on terror, are we seeing a return to post-heroic warfare? We will come to that question later on. So just a few words now about hunter-killer drones themselves. In his 1989 book, The Rise of American Air Power, Michael Sherry observed that the airplane was never viewed solely as a weapon, but also as the instrument of, quote, a whole new dimension in human activity, uniquely <coughs> capable of transforming man's sense of time and space, transcending geography, releasing humankind from its biological limits. Historically, however, military uses of aircraft have generally not seen humans released from the physical requirements of onboard control. Piloting an aircraft has usually meant being present therein, and that presence has often entailed a high degree of risk. So among combatants in the Allied forces during World War II, for example, bomber crews generally had the highest casualty rates. Also, those in an unarmed aircraft flying for a non-lethal purpose, say for reconnaissance purposes, they also experience risks such as enemy fire or mechanical failure. So to take Sherry's observation further, it would seem that a true and complete surmounting of so-called biological limits is to use aircraft in a way that does not endanger the user. And indeed, that idea has its origins at least uh, in the 1950s, where aircraft that carried sensors and other intelligence gathering equipment became increasingly unmanned, controlled by operators situated safely on the ground. These early drones were stingless, unarmed, like their male honeybee namesake. They had a limited range, they could only stay up for a short period of time, and they were highly prone to communications and control problems. An early version of the Predator made its debut in the Balkan Wars of the 1990s, gathering information for US military commanders on Serb air defences, refugee flows, and so on. The use of drones for information gathering did spare pilots from the risks associated with this activity, but at that time manned aircraft were still the dominant means of exercising air power. In 1995, the United States flew 500 manned missions over five days to rescue Captain Scott O'Grady after his F-16 fighter jet was brought down over Bosnia. And so not only was the use of manned aircraft in that particular conflict risky, it was also expensive. Now eventually, just as the pilots of early aircraft decided it would be a good idea to drop a grenade out of their open cockpit, eventually the temptation to arm the Predator proved too strong. And so the Predator evolved into a hunter-killer drone. And since 2002, the Predator has been equipped with two Hellfire missiles that can strike at a range of up to 8 kilometres. The newer, faster and larger Reaper aircraft, which was the first purpose-built hunter-killer drone, can carry 14 Hellfire missiles as well as laser-guided bombs. Both these aircraft are flying over Pakistan. Now, they are able to do so because Pakistan and Afghanistan are benign air environments, but in that space they do importantly provide US and Allied personnel with a constant eye in the sky, around the clock, staying off for hours at a time, and as the Quadrennial Defence Review report noted in February of last year, Unmanned aircraft systems such as the Predator and Reaper have proven to be invaluable for monitoring activities in contested areas, enhancing situational awareness, protecting our forces, and assisting in targeting enemy fighters. Now that latter capability is what we're going to be focusing on this evening, and it was highlighted by US President Barack Obama himself in a speech to the White House Correspondents' Dinner on the 1st of May last year. During his speech, he purported to protect his young daughters from the amorous attentions of some young male pop stars who were in attendance. And so the president joked, quote, The Jonas Brothers are here. They're out there somewhere. Sasha and Malia are huge fans, but boys, don't get any ideas. I have two words for you. Predator drones. You will never see it coming. <laughs> this was certainly the case on the evening of the 5th of August 2009 when a drone strike killed Baitullah Mesud, the leader of the Pakistani Taliban, allegedly also the mastermind of the 2007 assassination of Benazir Bhutto. Now on that evening, 5th of August 2009, Mesud lay on the rooftop in his father-in-law's house in a tiny village 
um, in the northwestern area of Pakistan known as South Waziristan. It was close to the border with Afghanistan. With him on the rooftop were his wife, his father-in-law. Masood was a diabetic. He was at the time receiving a leg massage as well as an intravenous drip to treat dehydration and stomach problems. But these problems would prove as naught compared, compared to what would come next. <laughs> Suddenly the house was engulfed in flame as two <coughs> hellfire missiles slammed into it. Masood was killed instantly along with 11 other people, among them his wife, father-in-law, mother-in-law and seven bodyguards. The missiles that killed Masood and those around him had been fired from a reaper hovering undetected about two miles above the house. The missiles had probably been assembled and loaded onto the drone at a hidden air base in southern uh, Pakistan, possibly by employees of Xi Services, a US-based security company formerly known as Blackwater. The Reaper, which is pictured here, is manufactured by the California form firm General Atomics. Um, it's 11 metres long, wingspan 20 metres, weighs a little over four and a half tonnes, and can fly at a maximum altitude of 50,000 feet for 30 hours. There's a round mounting under the nose of the drone known as the ball. And in that, there are two television cameras, one for seeing during the day and an infrared camera as well. There is also inside the ball a laser, uh, sorry, a radar device that facilitates viewing through clouds and smoke and dust, and crucially, a laser designator to lock onto any targets. Now, Importantly for us, the decision to kill by Tuan Su and the pressing of a button to make it happen reportedly took place 11,000 kilometres away at the Langley, Virginia headquarters of the CIA. And the person who, via satellite communications, remotely operated the drone and fired the missiles was probably either a CIA officer or a former member of the US military under contract to the agency. He or she would have been sitting at a console with a keyboard, a steering device resembling a joystick, and three uh, television screens. One of the screens would have live feed from the drone's camera. Another screen would have technical data on um, how the drone was going. And also a third screen which would have a GPS-generated navigation map. And for hours or possibly, possibly even days prior to that missile strike on Masood, the operator, the drone operator, and others at Langley would have been watching live, close-up video footage of that house in South Waziristan. Now, that drone strike on the 5th of August 2009 <coughs> was actually the last of 15 that had specifically targeted Mesud, um, but there is no uh, data on how many deaths, if any, resulted from the previous 14 attempts on his life. What's curious about the drone war, of course, is that officially it's a secret, and yet it's so large-scale and so well-reported and US intelligence officials are regularly quoted in the media. Drones are also being used in Libya, Yemen and Somalia, but those last three countries only came online in the drone war this year alone. In early June of 2011, just a couple of months ago, the Australian Army Lieutenant Marcus Case, who was a 27-year-old who had been operating a Heron drone in Afghanistan out of Kandahar, he died when a CH-47 Chinook helicopter he was travelling in crashed. It's important to recall and remember that in the ordinary course of his duties as a drone operator, Lieutenant Case would not have left the ground. So let's now turn to consideration of what it's like to be a drone operator, and how a drone operator sits as against other kinds of military professional. In the United States, there has been a switch, and as of 2009, the US Department of Defense is training more drone operators than fighter pilots. How are we and how are our enemies to regard this new generation of military aviators who experience no risk and are thus not required to exercise courage? But do our opinions about such matters even count? A few words about where this might be seen in terms of the values of the military profession as a whole. I guess it is because the military serves, because they strive to embody noble ideals, 
ideals that the civilian population either doesn't know or care about. It's because of these things that our warriors are admired and respected. We cheer them when they march through the streets. Uh, we honour the veterans. We mourn our military professionals when they die in battle. And there are certain conceptual elements that are common to military cultures <coughs> across time and space, across cultures, desirable qualities in warriors, and these include physical courage, endurance, strength and skill, and crucially, honour. And a warrior culture is one that celebrates martial training and skill, national service, and above all, demonstrated valour in combat. And so courage is a basic concept underpinning military cultures across all services in the United States and across all militaries around the world. Back in the era, era of heroic war, Theodore Roosevelt wished for his own sons to be tested in battle in the Great War. And he confided to a friend that he hoped that his sons might even be wounded or lose a limb so that that would be an enduring mark of their valour. It remains the case today that values such as honour, duty, courage and self-sacrifice are the basis of a covenant that binds soldiers together and also binds them to the society that they serve. The British political scientist Christopher Coker has remarked that war, like religion, defines our humanity because it demands of some that they surrender the instinct of self-preservation in the present to make life better for us in the future. Indeed, at the funeral service of Australian Commando Sergeant Todd Langley last month, his commanding officer said that Langley, quote, gave up his tomorrows for our todays, unquote. And so let's turn to this issue of courage in the face of risk. Aristotle wrote that the courageous man is one who is fearless in the face of an honourable death or of some sudden threat of death and that it is in war that such situations chiefly occur. For Napoleon, courage was the second most important quality of a soldier after endurance and an ability to put up with hardship. That great student of Napoleonic warfare, Prussian Major General Karl von Clausewitz, wrote of boldness, this noble impulse with which the human soul raises itself above the most formidable dangers is to be regarded as an active principle peculiarly belonging to war. And in all of this lies that crucial position of courage in the ethos of the military profession. John Stuart Mill argued that a regime of freedom requires men and women who value freedom enough to risk their lives in its defence. Could he have envisaged that the defenders of freedom would be able to do this without assuming physical risk? Because arguably, risk taking is the defining and indispensable characteristic of the warrior ethos. In no other profession is killing and being killed integral to the purpose of that profession. Arguably also, it is self-defence within conditions of reciprocal risk, which is the indispensable foundation for the internal morality of warfare. Warfare is something distinguishable from other forms of organised violence. And so this is why in 2002 the philosopher Paul Kahn wrote about the so-called paradox of riskless war, because he argued that without the imposition of mutual risk, warfare is not war at all. The premeditated organised killing that takes place must be called something else. So we have this issue about mutual self-defence. How important is it that that be a factor? The military historian Martin Van Crevel wrote that war does not begin when some people kill others. Instead, it starts at the point where they themselves risk being killed in return. And numerous other authors have written about what is essentially a contract, that a soldier has a license to kill, granted in exchange for being willing to be killed. And it's on this point that we need, crucially, to distinguish between the reduction of risk and the elimination of risk. And could it be that if you remove a warrior completely from risk and fear via, for example, an unmanned system, you in so doing create for the very first time a complete and perfect break in that ancient con connection between war and risk that defines warriors, soldiers, sailors and airmen. So, 
now politician and then author Michael Ignatieff wrote about the 1999 Kosovo campaign which achieved its objectives without a single NATO combat fatality. That this was an unprecedented achievement which had, in his view, transformed the expectations that govern the morality of war. But he observed that one side had killed with impunity and he complained that a war ceases to be just when it becomes a turkey ship. That's using his words. So one question we might pose ourselves is that if drone operators are combatants and we must regard them as combatants in order to allow them to participate in armed conflict at all, they would be considered legitimate targets for retaliation. And that's one thing. But realistically, is there physical safety in there? In August of 2009, a CBS 60 Minutes documentary uh, went out to a U.S. Air Force base in Nevada, Creech Air Force Base, about 40 minutes drive from Las Vegas. And during that documentary, um, there were two drone operators interviewed, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Goff and Colonel Chris Chambliss. I know that because I saw their name tags uh, displayed. And I also saw as I watched that documentary that uh, these particular drone operators were filmed in their homes. You could see the, the, uh, the street number of their house. And you had to ask yourself, how does this compare, for example, to the way that our SAS personnel constantly having their faces pixelated <coughs> in the footage? And it seems to suggest that drone operators who consent to be filled at home are so confident that they are not going to be subject to retaliation. It seems to suggest that they themselves feel as if they do not experience any risk in a warlike sense. But they are drone operators who fly predators and reapers armed with Hellfire missiles. Are they engaging in something that we might call non-courageous killing? And observers and participants in war have, in, at various times, expressed great distaste at this notion of non-courageous killing. And before I go into that, <coughs> uh, an interesting side argument about um, contrasting um, attitudes as between war and hunting in the United States. In 2004, an entrepreneur in Texas launched a website, www.liveshot.com. And this website allowed fee-paying users to log in and then aim and fire a real gun at real targets using the mouse. The website ultimately was intended as a so-called tele-operated hunting business and the intention was that live animals could be shot online by, quote, physically impaired hunting enthusiasts who could not go into the woods themselves, unquote. <coughs> but before this got up and running, 11 American states, including Texas, legislated against online hunting, and they insisted that a hunter had to be physically present uh, when hunting. And those who were lobbying against, lo lobbying for a ban on online hunting included both animal lovers and animal shooters, as it were. One of the latter was a Wisconsin um, congressman who said in 2005, quote, to me, hunting is about being out in nature and becoming one with nature, unquote. You had to be out there. For it, to be count as, for it to be counted as a sporting activity, as it were. Another um, warrior who has reflected on the comparison between war and hunting is a former sniper, Frank Percy Crozier. In 1937, in a memoir entitled The Men I Killed, he described how he enjoyed hunting big game <coughs> in Africa, but he eventually grew to balk at the bloodthirstiness of targeting humans. He said, quote, the game was dirty, I had to give it up. The cool, calculated murder of defenceless men was diabolical. He admitted to, quote, that sense of guilt, that conscience-stricken feeling of killing a man who at the moment was not menacing you and who was brought <coughs> almost within handshaking distance by the telescopic sights, unquote. In 1920, British air power was used against insurgents in Iraq. One pilot who was there at the time remarked, quote, we can wipe out a third of the inhabitants of the village in 45 minutes, killed by four or five machines, which offer them, the village inhabitants, no real target, no real opportunity to be glorious warriors. And Christopher Coker, 
who recounted this tale observed with those <coughs> British pilots that there was little glory in bombing unarmed, defenceless civilians. Just two weeks after the attacks of the 11th September 2001 in the United States, the author Susan Sontag wrote very controversially in the New Yorker magazine, quote, if the word cowardly is to be used, it might be more aptly applied to those who kill from beyond the range of retaliation, high in the sky, than to those willing to die themselves in order to kill others, unquote. More recently, critics of hunter-killer drones have suggested that unmanned systems, because they spare operators from danger and sacrifice, are creating what has been described as a virtueless war requiring neither courage nor heroism. To use the words of Brian Burridge, a former British Air Chief Marshal in Iraq. In his 2009 book, Wired for War, Peter Singer quotes a United States Air Force veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan explained that operating a drone is, quote, like being a pilot for nerds. Where is the sense of adventure, the sense of danger? Let's put it this way, I don't think they're going to make any movies about guys who fly predators, unquote. In the same year, in response to a soaring demand, no pun intended, for drone operators, the US Air Force began a training program for officers with no aviation background or any training in flying uh, to operate the Predator. And the uh, Air Force chief at the time, Norton Schwartz, decreed that the graduates of this training program should be called pilots. It was an issue whether or not they should be. And at their graduation ceremony, he pinned a specially designed set of wings on each trainee's uniform. And these wings featured lightning bolts to signify the satellite signals that connect drones uh, to their operators. And last year, a US Air Force Colonel Luther Turner told the Washington Post, quote, there is no valor in flying a remotely piloted aircraft. I get it, unquote. And yet, as of April 2007, US drone operators are eligible to be awarded the Air Medal and the Distinguished Flying Cross. The Distinguished Flying Cross, in particular, is a prestigious decoration that ranks just behind the Silver Star as a valor decoration. It is awarded for heroism or extraordinary achievement. And this is, to say the least, controversial in certain sections of the US Air Force. But perhaps old notions of courage and valor are either evolving or disappearing. According to one uh, US uh, drone operator and <coughs> squadron commander, Colonel Eric Mathewson, who's, who told the Washington Post last year, quote, Valor to me is not risking your life. Valor is doing what is right. Valor is about your motivations and the ends you seek. It is doing what is right for the right reasons. That to me is valor, unquote. Now Aristotle, Napoleon and Clausewitz would probably not agree with such a definition, but does it matter that a drone operator's faraway enemy has a perhaps more traditional, old-fashioned view of that virtue of courage. Because the word drone has become a colloquial word in Urdu, in Pakistan. It's used in pop lyrics accusing the United States of fighting without honor. There's a sense that although the hunter-killer drones might be deployed so as to create and instill fear in America's enemies, uh, the, the population of Pakistan itself, some sections thereof, are regarding hunter-killer drones as a sign rather that Americans are fearful. And there's a song of protest um, in Pakistan cities which purports to taunt the world's superpower for sending robots to do a man's job. And lines of that song include, America's heartless terrorism killing people like insects but honor doesn't fear power. This allegation of killing people like insects sounds a little bit like hyperbole. <coughs> but interestingly, at our conference in Washington in April of this year, former CIA director Michael Hayden described how when there was a predator circling overhead, those on the ground involved in ordering the use of its missiles from thousands of miles away could call up computer maps that show the potential effects of each weapon. Before any of the Hellfire missiles are launched, he said, the backup team asks for the so-called bug splat of the attack, which is basically a readout of the impact that the missile would have on its ground target. And so we see surrounding this technology a vast gulf as between 
the United States and its allies and local populations in these far-flung parts of the world, far from the US mainland, a vast gulf, physical and cultural, and where vast distances are leaving room for disrespect, mutual disrespect. So Colonel Mathewson again, the, our drone squadron, our drone squadron commander at Creech Air Force Base, again told Washington Post last year that he had a three-word mission statement for his unit which was, quote, kill expletive heads, or KFH for short. The notion that one can dazzle an enemy into submission through the use of high technology is somewhat problematic, especially if the message you are trying to send is not received in any way near the same form uh, by that particular audience. Could it be that in these parts of the world it is regarded as dishonourable to kill an enemy in a manner that involves no risk to the killer? Are these drone operator Americans, unlike their brothers on the ground, too afraid to fight? Because there is a vastly different understanding of war in play here, in this war on terror. But as between the United States in one part of the world and Pakistanis and Afghanis in another, there are hugely different understandings in the role of the warrior, what it means to engage in sacrifice. On the one side, you have the use of war in an instrumental fashion, as a means to an end. And on the other side, um, perhaps less touched by modernity, there are those who see war as a great metaphysical contest and placing a greater and different meaning on the very act of dying for a cause. And it's those local understandings and sensibilities that are so important as we engage in a form of warfare, but also a form of social transformation uh, known as counter-insurgency. In his 2009 book, Confronting the Hydra, Mark O'Neill emphasised the importance in counter-insurgency of rectitude and acting morally with integrity and justice remarking that insurgents and their supporters make decisions influenced by their hearts as well as their heads, Mark argued that counterinsurgents lacking rectitude will struggle to get others to accept whatever is morally ambivalent about their position or deeds. And likewise, in May of this year, um, the UK Ministry of Defence issued a joint doctorate note which included the statement, quote, the counterinsurgency operation must be perceived as ethically sound, above reproach, and the ill-considered use of armed unmanned aircraft offers an adversary a potent propaganda weapon. This enables the insurgent to cast himself in the role of underdog and the West as a cowardly bully that is unwilling to risk his own troops but is happy to kill remotely. The report went on to conclude that the use of armed unmanned systems in such a war of ideas needed to be carefully managed. So, as those in Pakistan and Afghanistan contemplate differing notions of courage, such a notion is also undergoing transformation within the US military itself. Unmanned warfare is intruding into military doctrine. Drone operators are increasingly encroaching on the space of those swaggering pilots who have long dominated military aviation, those magnificent men in their flying machines. When Frank Barrett researched the construction of masculinity in the US Navy in the mid-1990s, he found that aviators had the highest status amongst naval officers. He said that they came closest to embodying the warrior ideal, representing aggressiveness, technical mastery of complex machinery, courage and autonomy. And each of the pilots that he interviewed confirmed, quote, that his life is marked by a degree of recklessness and wildness, behaviour attributed to the danger associated with flying. And one pilot remarked, quote, each time we go out, we never know if we'll be back, so we live for today. We do tend to be wild and take more risks. It's a mortality thing, unquote. Peter Singer interviewed a former Defence Department analyst who joked that no fighter pilot is ever going to pick up a girl at a bar by saying that he flied that he flew a UAV. And rightly or wrongly, it is the case that masculine identity is a powerful characteristic of military culture to this day. And we might recall that great icon of Western military 
uh, mythology, Shakespeare's Henry V. On the eve of the Battle of Agincourt, and vastly outnumbered by the French, the English king gathered his men around him and he said, We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves a curse they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap, whilst any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. So from the perspective of those military professionals who are in the field, does a drone operator fight with us and shed his blood, or is he a gentleman in bed? Well, perhaps neither. This 15th century distinction between going to war and not going to war might sometimes no longer apply. Achilles went to Troy, the Anzacs went to Gallipoli, the SAS goes to Afghanistan, but a drone operator's mind alone goes to war, while his body remains at home, albeit encased in a flight suit. He manifests as a disembodied warrior, and this is paradoxical because the warrior's body is arguably the indispensable pillar of his unique moral status. If drone operators experience no risk, why should we as civilians spare a thought for their safety? And why indeed should we care about the killing that they do in our name? After all, it is not our fathers, brothers and sons who are dying. And on this point we come full circle and return to that controversial notion of post-heroic war as we contemplate the possible future of disembodied warriors, disengaged civilians. Robert E. Lee, the Confederate General in the US Civil War, said at the Battle of Fredericksburg in 1862, it is well that war is so terrible, otherwise we should grow too fond of it. And we often find that it's because their blood is personally invested that soldiers and the relatives of soldiers are the ones that are most vociferous in arguing against ill-considered foreign military adventures. But where the risks to, one own, to one's own forces are less, could it be that there is less reason to hesitate before waging war? In NATO's 1999 Kosovo campaign, precise air power coupled with the impunity given by stealth bombers and standoff weapons capability, <coughs> this all served to dramatically lower the threshold for the use of force. And indeed, the official US Air Force report on that intervention included the statement, quote, the air war over Serbia offered airmen a glimpse of the future, one in which political leaders turned quickly to the choice of aerospace power to secure the alliance's security interests without resorting to more costly and hazardous alternatives that would have exposed more men and material to the ravages of war. Now, lowering the threshold for deciding to use force is not necessarily a bad thing, we might say. If your cause is just, let us hasten in its pursuit. But there needs also to be proper authority for using force, a democratic mandate, if you will, because if the situation escalates, the home population could be imperiled. And so what is remarkable about the use of hunter-killer drones is how little public discussion there has been, uh, certainly in Australia, certainly in the United States. And yet we are witnessing possibly the rise of a radically new, a geographically unbounded use of lethal force by states. And some have raised the concern that because drone warfare is risk-free, this works to isolate the American people from the military actions that are taken in their name, and that this undermines the political democratic checks on endless war. And so as Michael Ignatieff recalled in, in terms of the Kosovo intervention, in virtual war, as he called it, citizens are, di are divested of their power to give consent. Now you'll recall that in April of this year, um, Barack Obama authorised the use of armed drones over Libya, and are we perhaps seeing another little glimpse of the virtual war and asking questions about consent and authority? Because in June of this year, the White House argued that Congress did not need to authorize U.S. military operations in Libya because, quote, U.S. operations do not involve sustained fighting or active exchanges of fire with hostile forces, nor do they involve the presence of U.S. ground troops, U.S. casualties or a serious threat thereof, or any significant chance of escalation into a conflict characterised by those factors." Unquote. If it's drones alone going in, Congress does not need to authorise 
this military action. And the risk, of course, that is that if war becomes more and more unreal to the citizens of modern democracies, will they care enough, will we care enough to ask for restraint and to exert greater control over the violence that is exercised in our name? And where it is easier to use force, there is greater scope for using force for purposes and in ways that are essentially aggressive rather than defensive. And so I'll bring this to a close. You might recall two characters from Joseph Heller's 1955 novel Catch-22. Airmen in a fictitious American bomber squadron based in Italy in 1944. One of the characters named Orr and the other Yesarian. And this is a passage from that book. There was only one catch and that was Catch-22 that specified that a concern for one's own safety in the face of dangers that were real and immediate was the process of a rational mind. Orr was crazy and could be grounded. All he had to do was ask, and as soon as he did, he would no longer be crazy and would have to fly more missions. Orr would be crazy to fly more missions and sane if he didn't, but if he was sane, he had to fly them. Yesarian was deeply moved by the absolute simplicity of the clause of Catch-22 and let out a respectful whistle. That's unquote. So by removing the pilot from any danger, do hunter-killer drones now render Catch-22 obsolete? Because operating a drone arguably requires neither craziness nor courage. Or could it be that there is now a new catch? Removing oneself from risk completely is arguably the most sane thing a warrior could want. And yet only by experiencing at least a scintilla of risk can a killer claim to be acting in a warlike manner. If drone operators kill without exercising courage, can we admire them? If we can't, does it matter? But I think we do need to admire our military <coughs> professionals for their sake as well as ours. Such admiration is an important foundation for recruitment, retention, morale, and more generally for a sense of professional and national self-worth. But how relevant and important is courage likely to be into the future? And is the non-courageous use of hunter-killer drones an aberration or a transformation in military affairs? And we might envisage two alternative futures. One is that this is merely all an aberration, and that this form of air power, like so many forms of air power in the past, will prove disappointing. Recall that in his 1921 book, The Command of the Air, Italian General Giulio Due argued that the invention of airplanes had rendered obsolete all other parts of the military. Remember also that there is huge opposition within air forces to the increasing presence of drone operators, opposition led by the fighter and bomber pilots, and they are a force to be reckoned with. And most importantly, could this all be an aberration if we are looking at a future characterised not by more Kosovo's, but by more Afghanistan's, where counterinsurgency, a slow, risky, long-term grind, is the pathway to success rather than limited use of air power. Now, we could leave it at that, but we must note that the US military is anticipating a large increase in its use of hunter-killer drones. Admiral Mike Mullen, then chairman of the US Joint Chiefs of Staff in 2009, said that he believed that the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter would be the last manned aircraft. In June of this year, the U.S. Congressional Budget Office reported that the U.S. Department of Defense planned to increase its drone inventory by 35% over the next 10 years, spending $40 billion over that period. And the bulk of its new acquisitions would not be uh, small reconnaissance drones, but large hunter-killer drones like the Predator, the Reaper, and the Reaper's successor, the jet-powered Avenger, buying at least an extra 288 reapers in the next 10 years. And so do we then start to contemplate a drone arms race, an Iranian drone, a Chinese drone, drone against drone, each competing with greater and greater levels of sophistication. And in that scenario, we need to be mindful that there is and will continue to be a technological imperative to reduce and perhaps eliminate human control. Because the human being Unable to think, decide and act quickly enough is becoming the weakest link in our highly networked military systems. 
The human brain is the cognitive weak link. Human flesh needs to be accommodated and protected in the engineer, engineering, construction and use of aircraft and other platforms. And without a pilot, drones can fly at very high altitude without pressurization, temperature control requirements. There's more payload capacity through the space that's saved. They can stay up in the air longer and so on and so forth. And crucially, currently, drones are highly dependent on satellite communications and vulnerable to any break in those communications. And so the system which can operate in the absence of communications links will have an obvious military advantage. And in that, we contemplate the possibility of autonomous drones. Will we withstand technological pressure and hold fast to the notion that war is necessarily and inescapably a human affair? Or will we come to rely on autonomous drones that are not or need not be enslaved to satellite communications? Autonomous drones that can decide for themselves whether, when and who to kill. It is perhaps not too early to start contemplating such a world. A world of predators, reapers and post-human war. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you'll agree with me that Christian's talk tonight was wide ranging and uh, whilst drone warfare might be risk free, I suspect some of the questions uh, that he's about to entertain may not be. We have 20 minutes uh, for our question and answer <coughs> session, but we do like to finish our lectures here on time at the National Security College. So I would ask that uh, if you have a question, you stand up, you identify yourself in any <coughs> obvious organisational or affiliation you might have. Please speak clearly because, like all of our presentations, we are recording this for subsequent podcast. And I would ask that you ask a question uh, succinctly rather than make a party political speech so we can get through the number of questions we'll undoubtedly have. Sir, up the I'm Pedro Villagrande, Ambassador of Argentina, but I'm here just on, on my own interest in this. You mentioned all this, uh, uh, the fight in the particular situation that you have in, in cases like Afghanistan where you are attacking. Uh, terrorists or civilians associated with terrorists. If you have this asymmetry that the drones create, would not that justify or make these people go and try to exercise their response to targets which may be attainable? The drones are not, and, that, and thus increasing terrorism, in fact, because it's the only place where they can actually hit the ones that are hitting them. Thank you, Excellency. Um, a, a good point, and um, arguably um, the right to self-defence is inalienable, um, and that the harder someone tries to reduce your ability to exercise that right, the harder you are entitled to try and get at uh, the side attacking you. Um, and an interesting point to raise in response to your question is, if a member of a terrorist organisation, if we want to call that organisation terrorist, if such a person um, attacked a drone operator in his Las Vegas suburban home, would we regard that as an act of war in the exercise of self-defence, or would we regard that as murderous or terroristic in nature? And I think the unfortunate conclusion is that only by regarding that as warlike rather than murderous can we maintain the notion that drone operators really are combatants entitled um, to participate in warfare. So that's a test case for exactly how seriously we take combatant status. And I think it's the ultimate test of whether or not we're willing to um, acknowledge a right to self-defence, even in circumstances of extreme asymmetry. Thank you. Thanks, question, for a very stimulating presentation. Uh, Hugh Smith, visiting fellow, University College Adler. Uh, lots of questions, but I'll only ask one. Uh, it seems to me there is an inherent and deep tension from the military perspective with regard to drones. Because it's rather dirty work, it's not terribly honourable, not terribly glorious, as you say, it's killing civilian <coughs> assassination, murder perhaps. From a military perspective, it's fine to let some other organisation do it, some other organisation like the CIA or anyone else 
not immutable. Uh, on the other hand, there are strong arguments for keeping it in people's <coughs> hands. Uh, one, of course, is to, to keep your role, particularly the Air Force has suggested that they, they may be running out of um, manned aircraft. Uh, but there's a more fundamental point of two more. One is, if you're going to use violence for political purposes, as a political instrument, it should be kept in the hands of one organisation that you can control as a government. Also, it's kept in the hands of an organisation that is trained and imbued with the law of armed conflict. And you can say a great deal about that. Uh, it's interesting to speculate whether there was a choice in getting rid of Bin Laden, whether that should be done by a drone or by the SEALs, by uniformed people. And I, I would love to know about that debate. My, my question is, do you, do you see this as, as an inherent tension and uh, can it ever be resolved? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Hugh, and I, I won't even touch the Bin Laden issue, but um, your point about international humanitarian law is, is, is well made. And indeed, one of the principal concerns that lawyers have about the reported use of CIA officers in running the drone war over Pakistan is there is uncertainty as to whether those drone operators in the CIA are trained in the laws of war in the same way that the US military is. And you can have a greater degree of confidence if you know that someone in uniform is operating the drone, that at least they know the meaning of discrimination and proportionality and uh, minimising harm and, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, the, the great dilemma for the United States is that um, it, it, it's wanting to reassure people that it is using force discriminately and in a proportionate fashion over Pakistan, but the government won't acknowledge um, the, the reported reality that the CIA is engaged uh, in, in those activities. And so there's an imperative to somehow let it be known that yes, the CIA is properly comprehensively trained in international humanitarian law. And then there's the question which goes to the tension point that you raise. If you've got a situation where Air Force um, uh, an Air Force uh, airman trained in IHL is operating a drone and a CIA contractor or employee trained in IHL is operating a drone um, and that you can have confidence that the that, that force will be used ethically under those circumstances um, why bother distinguishing between those two kinds of operator? And that's something that makes um, the military profession nervous in some circles because wearing a uniform does and ought to matter to them. Um, maybe the tension will be resolved in an unsatisfactory fashion by the emergence of a new quasi-combatant, a CIA combatant, but it's highly controversial and some law professors in the United States have referred to CIA drone operators as unlawful combatants. I don't think there's a quick answer to your question. Well, we've heard a lot about from the American perspective, but I'll invite one of our American friends, Paul Lashenko, to uh, pose a question. Thank you very much, sir, for your presentation. Pretty provocative and refreshing to hear different views, especially because I just redeployed from Afghanistan working with some of these uh, systems. I'm curious how your argument of post heroic war reconciles four fundamental tensions or paradoxes that I see, and I'll call these the four C's. The first one is comparative advantage. Uh, some of the philosophers and thinkers you talked about in the 15th century understood principles of war, and the UAV provides surprise, maneuver, and things of this nature. The second one would be confusing, or confusing the moral legal authority that a commander has to actually authorize a deployment of munition with the drone operator himself who does not. The third one might be conflating, that we're actually taking drone operators who represent 0.01 or 0.001% of our military and extrapolating a wider trend to post-war war. And the final one would be cycles, and this is probably the most important one to think about, and that is targeting cycles, that no matter what targeting cycle you use, special operations or conventional, you still have to gather intelligence that fuels these type of munitions. So therefore, you actually put soldiers in more harm and more risk. And those are the tensions that I'm talking about, sir. Um, I didn't quite get all of it down, so I might have to buttonhole you later on and uh, take that further. I, I guess um, 
I'll, uh, I'll duck most of that except on the point of comparative advantage, um, which of course is something that we, we, we ought to pursue. Um, but um, the ambassador raised the issue of when, when a symmetry becomes uh, so immense that war is rendered a one-sided experience of risk. Have, has your advantage become so great that you've crossed a line into something that Michael Nadif would call a turkey shoot, uh, whereby there is no element of self-defense in anything that you are doing because of the platform you are using? And, and, and whereas I'm willing to take this argument about comparative advantage right up to the point where one side still retains a scintilla of risk, I, I, I propose that once you've completely divested yourself of risk, what you're engaging in is something other than war. And of course that's provocative, and I would relish the chance to talk with you about that later. Gentleman there, David Charles. Uh, Dr. Mike, uh, David Goyne, I wonder if you're just privileging novelty here. Uh, in effect, an artillery piece, uh, an artillery shell fired indirectly is just a dumb drone. A ship sailing off the coast firing a shell into uh, some uh, foreign country could probably have done that quite safely. As you said, with imperial policing from the air, uh, pilots could do that quite safely. A pilot flying over Kosovo on a perfectly manned aircraft at 15,000 feet could have done that quite safely. The only thing that's new here is probably the range and the uh, things. And what you're really separating is the purpose of it and the, and the purpose for which it's done, and the legality probably lies in that, not in the risk to which the combatant is placed. If this was a war against a peer competitor to the United States, then the risk might be quite as great that they would be flying drones over uh, an Air Force base outside Las Vegas and dropping uh, their own bombs down on it. So the risk, I think, is completely separable from the the purpose of it, the legality lies in the purpose and the way it's done, the legitimacy of the target. And everything else is really just novelty. Um, yes, and it's possible that a threshold has already been crossed um, and that a drone is not just glorified artillery shell, but probably even a glorified arrow launched from a longbow. Um, I guess it depends how much attention you want to pay to. Um, to whether or not this technology really does um, cross a line that hasn't been crossed before, which is to say it's crossed from reduction to elimination of risk. <coughs> now, yes, you are right, and you could object, you could object to artillery, high altitude bombing, um, missiles fired from ships, off, ships offshore, for the same reasons that you could object to um, the, this imbalance in risk that I've highlighted uh, with regards to drones. Uh, but is there, is there something that is genuinely new about drones? And the range issue arguably is important because when you're operating a drone from 11,000 kilometres away, um, that's, that's getting, getting towards the maximum distance as you can be apart from any other place on, on, the, on the point of the Earth or, or getting up there towards. And because it's satellite oriented, that can certainly come into play. But has there been a line crossed because unlike, for example, an artillery shell, or a cruise missile, or, or an arrow, or something, the drone operator also has this kind of out-of-body experience of sort of hovering over the target. And having a kind of human um, interaction with that person in a way that someone um, firing a ranged weapon from a long distance would never get. And so maybe the newness as you suggest, shouldn't be contemplated so much in ethical and legal terms, but rather in sociological terms in term, as regards how the military profession sees itself and how a drone operator fits in with the rest of the profession as a non-risk taker. I would suggest to you the difference is that uh, you know, once war had moved, and it did this a long time ago, thousands of years ago, moved along being between being a duel between equals, handicapped in some way so that everyone was equal. Mm. And Achilles probably wasn't equal to all the people he killed. He was more than equal. It, 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 that, that idea of seeking an advantage and 
shooting the man in the back if you got the chance has always been just viewed as good tactics. Oh, sure, sure. And look, um, and war is not about an equal contest. War is not about an equal contest. I guess my argument is that um, it needs to be some kind of contest, uh, however imbalanced. And unless one side has at least a scintilla of risk, then there's no real contest in play. So that's, that's what I'm after. And it may well be that the high-altitude bomber and the guy on the ship offshore has so little, is experiencing so little risk that you might regard that as virtually zero. But I, I would suggest that it's not actually zero because a plane could drop out of the sky, a ship could be in theatre closer to the action, artillery could be in theatre closer to the action, that, that because of their physical presence in theatre they are that much more likely to endure risk than a drone operator, even if it's only a slight difference. Yeah, I, I would suggest to you, and we'll, I don't want to this forever. We'll have to take that off long, mate. But what I'm just saying is <coughs> you're conflating fairness with morality, and it's not the same. Okay. We'll take that as a comment, to paraphrase someone else. Um, I did offer the suggestion, Christian, before that drone operators could choke up a donut. Keeping <laughs> 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 um, our philosophy here at the National Security <coughs> College of Time, it's time for one more question, and uh, Charles Eikens, uh, you have the... Uh, Charles Eikens, I'm an exchange officer at Defence. Uh, I was once told by someone, I'm also retired from the Marine Corps, and I was once told by someone that everyone's experience of war is different, and it affects them differently. Uh, and uh, one of the things we know a lot more about now is post-traumatic stress disorder and the, the mental and psychological effects of, of killing or being exposed to it. I'm wondering if the drone operator who has breakfast with his children, drops them off at school, and then goes off and kills somebody uh, lying on a rooftop in Pakistan, uh, I, I wonder if, if you're not underestimating the psychological risk of that person. There may not be physical risk, but there is certain, certainly psychological risk, uh, particularly, and, and in fact the statement you made about the disembodiment would, would, would support that. Uh, I would be interested in seeing how Colonel Matheson, uh, his psychological profile 10 years from now after he's he pushed the button on many people and then gone home and had dinner with his children. So I think you, it's more than just physical risk, there is also a psychological risk. And, and so therefore, I think that, that needs to be, have you, have you thought about that and taken that into count in, in this theory? Uh, it was with immense reluctance that I ripped out the entire emotional risk section of my paper and I'm therefore indebted to you for, for bringing this up because it is probably the major caveat to my argument about risk and I guess the conversation would then need to turn to whether we want to distinguish between physical and emotional risk and I will say this much that um, the, the use of hunter killer drones is sufficiently new that there is, there is hardly any psychological research into the emotional trauma of killing someone and then driving 40 kilometres back to Las Vegas and talking to your kids about their homework. And it, it must be quite a bizarre thing to go through. I, I literally can't imagine what it must be like. Um, but there are early indications, and Congress has expressed its concern initially, that this is something that will have to be watched and that emotional and psychological risks uh, can and, and may well be endured in a big way by drone operators. And look, I'm, I guess I'm just really grateful that you've mentioned that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll call it stump stairs for this evening. Um, please join me in thanking Christian for quite a substantial presentation.